Hey, welcome everybody. This is John Paul Mendoza, Dr. Speed Selling, and this is the Raging Verbalist number 36 for those of you keeping track. Hopefully you're keeping track out there. Raging Verbalist happens every Friday, approximately 8 a.m. Pacific time. You got Murphy, you got all kinds of other things, but it happens. Also with me, as always, the, the lovely Sandra, who will come on in a second. She's going to ask some questions and we'll go through our topic at hand. But before we get started, uh, just a little bit of a sad note. Uh, as we were getting ready to pull all this together, uh, I, I saw on my feed that Herman Cain, 74 years old, passed away because of coronavirus. Uh, Herman was a very kind guy to us, to, to myself and Gabe in putting together the book. In fact, last year when we were in Las Vegas and we showed him the book. He helped also make sure that we got the title right, which is most businesses fail in their first five minutes. And uh, his only reaction is, I've been there and done that. So sad day about that, Herman. Sorry that you, you went, uh, 74 years young. So for those of you who never met him, I mean, he was a really nice guy. You may not agree with him. I understand that. But he was a really nice guy, an interesting guy. And of course, he is in our book because he was book worthy and now will be memorialized as always book worthy. So we're starting off with that kind of note, but I had to just, you know, you should always show gratitude and also memory of those who may have helped you along the way. Now with that, I'll bring in Sandra. Sandra, welcome to Raging Verbalist. Hello, how are you doing today? Doing well, a little, you know, a little sad. I mean, and, and I know you, you had a chance to meet Herman. I don't know if you want to say a couple of words about him. Yeah, like you said, a really nice guy. And I remember um, running his book signing at Freedom Fest. We were working in the bookstore and he was one of the authors. So, Always was a kind guy, always showed yeah. a lot of respect and, and uh, you know, didn't, didn't turn anybody down, didn't return down a request to get, you know, photograph. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, so... But having said that, we, we move on and we'll talk about our topic for today, which is how to build the ideal network. So you should be taking some notes. I mean, I'm going to talk to you about what I'm doing, but you should also learn a few things about how to put together an ideal network. And the reason why that's important is that I believe that the network and the network effect is going to be even greater as we move forward than ever before. And with that, I'm going to have Sandra ask the very first question. What are the benefits of a network? So the point of building a network is, and frankly, a network as a concept didn't exist before about a hundred and a little over a hundred years ago. In fact, the early un, you know, pioneers of building a network were actually David Sarnoff, who built the original radio network in which he understood that by being the broadcaster and having local radio stations that would then pick up his feed and they used wires. I mean, talk about, you know, back to the future like we have today, you know, with what we're doing now, right? Because we're using, you know, I know people will say, well, John, it's wireless. Trust me, there are wires everywhere. And uh, what Zarnoff figured out is that, is that a network was very powerful. So the benefits of a network and why a network makes sense and why it works, why it expands things, is that it has a great deal of leverage. I mean, think about it. This is how we create and build a community of like-minded individuals. See, prior to that concept, prior to that way, now, you know, there, there were newspapers, there were other mechanisms. But think about it, somebody builds this radio network and something happens in New York City and there's a place in you know, Wichita, Kansas where they're hearing it, not tomorrow, not written by somebody else, but basically the same day. Amazing things happen with networks, but then you move that forward, you get to where we are today, and really the internet is a network of networks is the way you'd like to think about it. And now we put the layer on of when we want to go accomplish something is how do we build a network that makes sense to bring like-minded individuals, like markets together, and in fact, get information and insights that match those goals and what takes place. So networks allow you to do things that you couldn't do individually. And most importantly, what networks do 
is networks, in fact, then can pull from all edges of the world. This world has been getting ever smaller and smaller. Now, physically, it's the same, but it is the fact that we can communicate so rapidly and that we can, in fact, tie those communications together that in any moment, any sense of time, we can connect almost instantly. In fact, a few months ago, I was on a Zoom call with a bunch of Peruvian entrepreneurs. Now, without the aid of me learning how to speak Spanish, I can say enchilada, I can say taco. I don't even know if taco is even a Spanish word or not. But anyway, uh, I was able to do this hour and a half program. Now, one of the things they talked about is it would be great if we had simultaneous translation. But we had that thing packed. In fact, they had to limit the number of people who could come on just because of the infrastructure of Peru. That's pretty cool. And that, that is the power of a network and why networks are not only viable, but today necessary if you're going to grow and build something that is going to be sustainable going forward. So Sandra, what is our next question? Are all networks created equal? So the answer to that one is, is that networks come in all different sizes and a variety of different flavors, if you will. And I don't think all networks are created equal. In fact, when you think that a network or when you think something is ubiquitous, which is a fancy word of like saying everywhere, I'll just use the Starbucks example. Starbucks is almost a network, if you will. It, you know, and, and people will go into a Starbucks because they know that they'll get essentially the same thing that they would get in Seattle, that they'll get in Dallas, that they'll get in New York, that they'll get in Denver. And it doesn't matter because they'll walk in and they can get their s'mores frappuccino and you know, spend about five and a half bucks. So that's kind of a network. Now, whenever you think of a network that you belong to, and here is the realization, we all belong to a series of networks, a series of things that we consider that work for us. And this is a level of abstraction that most businesses don't figure out. If you're not attached to a network in some way, shape, or form, and if you think you can do things in isolation, lots of luck. Because if you do, what happens is that you are actually very much out on a limb, and it will be hard to continue to grow and to build. The power of a network is, in fact, you can get inside of a network, and that network helps you by giving you leverage and allows you to get to more people more rapidly. So all networks are not created equal. In fact, some of the mega networks that we're seeing today, think about how many people use Google every day. Think about how many people use Facebook every day. Think about how many people use Twitter every day. Instagram, Snapchat, keeps going on. Those are all networks. But then there's all Amazon, you know, huge network. Now, the challenge of it is, is, that, is that those are in some ways closed networks, but those networks work for those who are in fact doing business with them, who are selling to them, selling through them, and what that looks like. Now, right now there's a lot of, and I'm veering off into politics for everybody for here in a second. There's a lot of talk about, well, shouldn't we go breaking these things up? Well, I guess we could say that because we're afraid of the power of the network. But the reality of it is, is that most of the networks that we see as omnipotent, that are unassailable, did not exist over 25 years ago, did not exist. In fact, some of them didn't exist 15 years ago. Now, one can live in fear and say, these networks are too big and they're too powerful. But now what we're doing is we're predicting the future. I would say that there are going to be new networks that will come about. There will be new things that will, will take place. So Google was happy skipping down the road, whistling a happy tune, and then, of course, Facebook came and started inhaling a bunch of their traffic. And then Amazon has now become this search engine. And then, well, now, now we have Instagram where they're paying people, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to go out and do, uh, you know, product launches and discussions. All of those are networks. Now, you may say all of those are big, giant networks, and maybe that doesn't, you know, that, that kind of locks me out. That means I can't go out there and start thinking about building a network. 
what I am going to tell you is you want to figure out what networks that you belong to, what networks make sense for who you are, what you want to accomplish. Because frankly, a network is a very powerful way to enter a market. And in fact, now you have a group of people who are already preconditioned to do business with you. And that is part of what the network effect is, is people who are like-minded. See, when I traveled before COVID-19, and I would tell people about certain things, all you have to do is pick a year when I was traveling. I was always at the forefront talking about these things. Right now, Zoom has gone through uh, an incredible growth spurt because of COVID-19. Well, I was already on top of that trend a few years ago. Now, Zoom is, all become, uh, is rapidly becoming a, you know, it, it isn't a name of a company. It's, well, you know, we're going to Zoom. Now, think about the people who had built, <laughs> who had gone out and built WebEx and GoToMeeting and those other older technologies. Well, all I can tell you is that the guys at Zoom, if they're not careful, will also be faced with other competition. Now, it doesn't mean that they're gonna lose out on this thing, but essentially they're building a network because they're building a lifestyle and networks overlap each other. If one does a Venn diagram of your own life, you'll see that there are multi-layers of networks that you belong to and each network delivers something to you that in fact gives you something more than you put into it. So not all networks are created equal. In fact, many networks require you to go out there and find them. What is sad to a certain extent is how many of us stop because we have this a certain inherent laziness, this inertia, uh, what's called homeostasis, and we don't actually go out and look for new networks that may in fact benefit us and move us to the next level. My suggestion to all of you is to consciously be aware of the networks that you belong to and how those networks affect your life and are there other networks that could help propel you to where you want to go. And Sandra, I'm looking at the time. We have time for one more question before we're going to get to a break. So what is the next question, please? Uh, why start a new network today? So I was faced with this question of why start a new network today. And let me just tell you a quick story. Decided that I was seriously going to write a book. By the way, I started writing several books over the years. I've hired ghost writers. I've gone through that process and never really got one completely done. Ended up meeting somebody uh, who is my co-author, co-conspirator, and business partner, and Gabe Batista said, John, we're gonna, I'm going to help you. I'm going to put my shoulder to the wheel. We're going to get this done. Now, that was like a two-year effort to do that. And it just so happened to coincide, you know, as, as, we're, as we're rolling through, you know, space and time. And what, what did we hit? Well, coronavirus hit. And it blew up our launch, which, of course, now I need to relaunch the book. Most businesses fail in their first five minutes. How about, you know, geez, you know, that, that launch was okay. We put a lot of energy and effort, but didn't get to where we wanted to go. Doesn't mean we're, we're not going to keep banging away at it. In fact, you'll hear me every week talk about the book and shamelessly plug it in just a few minutes. But because of that, there was an opportunity that opened up. And that opportunity that opened up is that as the entire world was collapsing all around me, like in the movie Inception, what I see in that is that there is an opportunity because of the number of businesses that are going through cataclysmic changes and pressures and those types of things. And what popped up in my head is what we have actually started to put together, which is the Turnaround Engine Network. So I'm very interested in networks. I was interested in them before and how to utilize them. But starting a new network today made sense because there was this massive opportunity. Think of this, 32 and a half million businesses in the United States, roughly. All but five, in my way of thinking, are going to need to do some amount of turning around, restructuring, and getting better. The five that I wrote down on that list that first day that we thought about building a network, which was several months ago, actually, and they were Apple and Amazon and Microsoft and Facebook and Google. 
Well, lo and behold, we haven't even launched our network. The network hadn't even been launched when May 21st, Mark Zuckerberg announces that, well, he's going to see a future in which Facebook, for those of you who don't know, Mark Zuckerberg is founder of Facebook, is that half of his workforce, 200,000 people, he never anticipates them coming back to be housed in a building. Dramatic shift, amazing shift. Now, that's a restructuring. And we said that they didn't have to. But think about it. They didn't have to, but they have already started moving in that direction. Just a couple days ago in the Wall Street Journal, first page, Google says to all their employees, look, because of the uncertainty caused by the coronavirus and the you know, outbreaks that keep flaring up, we're not going to have people come back until July of 2021. Anyone out there want to place a bet that a lot of those people never go back to a building? So now two of the five that we said didn't need to go through restructuring are already syst uh, you know, systematically going through and restructuring their businesses. So the Turnaround Engine Network was designed and built from the ground up to take advantage of the fact that there will be lots of opportunity, more than I've ever seen in my entire 27 years of doing turnarounds. And more importantly, all of these businesses are going to need help in one shape or another. Now, how do you, in fact, go out there and grab and get your hands around that opportunity? Well, one way is to be closed about it. Oh, I'm not going to tell anybody about it. The other is to establish a network, which is what, in fact, we're doing. And the Turnaround Engine Network, just two days ago on Wednesday, is that we launched the beta site of that. Uh, my good friend Perry Marshall was our launch partner. And in fact, if you go to turnaroundengine.com, you can learn more about this. The critical part about it is that I'm going to share with you what is involved and what you get out of having a network like this. But more importantly, the challenge of every single, every single one of us is what are the networks that support the life that we are going to lead today, but also have sustainability to support where we're going to in the future. If you don't think in those terms, then you're going to be in serious trouble. In my mind, whether you join the network that we're creating or find another network, I believe that the network effect is going to be more important in the next 10 years than it has been so far, and that's saying a lot. Now, before we get back into the questions, let me tell you how you can find out more about what I do. And let me show you the said book that just crashed and burned while we were trying to launch it, which is, you know, and, and just a little bit of music. Da, da. So most businesses fail in the first five minutes. It just takes three to five years to realize it. Position to win. Labor of love. Go out there and pick this up on Amazon. Barnes and Noble. Books a million. Can pick it up physically. By the way, you can go to positionwin.positionwinbook.com. Positionwinbook.com. Can can go buy a autographed copy if you have a mind to. You also can get a Kindle, a Nook, uh, Apple also has it. So there's that. And then the other side of it is if you're interested in finding out and seeing how a network gets put together, we are in the beta phase right now. So there's some special pricing. Go check it out. Turn around engine. Dot com, turnaroundengine.com, turnaroundengine.com. So that is the network that I am designing to try to build an ideal network. And by the way, if you join during the beta period, first off, you get better pricing, but more importantly, you'll get to see how one of these things gets assembled. And that may in fact help you because somewhere down the road, you may want to build your own network. All right, Sandra, what is our next question? Yeah, uh, what gave you the idea to start a network? Now, that's a great question. So here's what gave me the idea. Uh, abject being angry and pissed off that here I had worked so hard, so long to finally get, finally get <laughs> this book done and get it out there and have the right publicist and the right, you know, book consultant 
and to have all of those right things put into place and have it just blow up. You know, there's a saying that says, you know, man or humans, I want to try to be, don't want to exclude anybody. We plan and God laughs. Well, somebody was laughing, but it wasn't me. So what really inspired me to do it was two things. First off is that I'm not a believer that you should spend a lot of time lamenting what hasn't happened. What you should spend your time doing is going out and making things happen. And to make things happen is you have to look at the situation and say, what can I do to improve my situation and circumstance? What can I do that takes me to that next level? And as I started looking around and noticing all of these businesses that were seriously in trouble, and you've heard on Raging Verbalist, if you've listened to some of the other episodes where we talk about businesses that have gone, gone bankrupt, is that all of those businesses are directly in my wheelhouse for taking a business, restructuring it, turning it around, and keeping it alive, if at all possible, and making sure that it doesn't just go away and be in the ash bin of history. So what motivated me was, in fact, this circumstance and situation. Now, I know that every single business out there is going to need to do some level of turning their business around. And maybe you say, John, wait a second, you're, you're, you, know, you put this network together, what does it do? Now, I teach people how to go out and find businesses that need help. But let's say you, it's you. Let's say it's back to you need help yourself. Well, this is the fastest, least expensive way to find out how you can restructure your own business. Because if you don't realize how close you are to falling apart and falling off the edge of the cliff, you are kidding yourself. I can tell you there is going to be extensive carnage that's going to take place. We haven't even seen the beginning of it. All you have to do is watch the high volatility in the stock market and watch what's going on. And here's what you will figure out. Something is going on and it's going to continue going on. Are you going to watch it take place or are you going to in fact move forward and be part of making positive improvements and making things work? All right, what is the next question, Sandra? Uh, how does somebody benefit from being part of a network? So one of the most important things about a network is that no matter how much time, energy, and effort you put in, you can never know more than a group of dedicated individuals who are looking at a similar area or body of knowledge. And think about it this way. If you went out today and you started searching on Google, they would be happy by the way, and you started trying to amass this information, what you'll discover is that no matter how fast you run, no matter how hard you put in the effort, no matter what all of those things are, is that you will struggle to get to a very small fraction of a percentage of knowledge. However, if you're part of a network, and an active network, which is in fact what the Turnaround Engine Network is, in fact, it is made up of three components, which I'll share with you right now. So the benefits of it are, first off, there's training, learning about a subject matter, learning about what, what, how this is put together. See, I learned how to do business mergers and acquisitions, specifically a leverage buyout. And I did the first one by buying a book and hiring my father's attorney. I would never recommend that to anybody right now. That was bravado over brains beyond belief. It's a lot of bees in there. But what I'm going to tell you is that you definitely, definitely don't want to do that. So part of it is training and getting trained by the network because the network has a level of intelligence and, and insight and capability that brings that together. Peter Drucker said that when one looks at it, there are really three levels. The bottom level is data. Now, the internet is filled with lots and lots and lots and lots of data. And that data is 
somewhat valuable. And sometimes even Wikipedia gets some things right. But what happens is that you have all of this data. Now you have to sift and sort and find things in it. If you're not familiar with the statement that there's a pony in there somewhere, well, you can go check that out on the internet too. But usually you have to go through a lot of horseshit to find the pony, but there's a pony in there somewhere. So the, so the most important thing that you wanna remember is that that's data. Now, what you need to do is that you have to raise the value up. You have to go through a methodology and you have to take that from data to information. And information is when this starts to become usable, becomes useful. See, just having facts and figures, just having the raw material and information doesn't actually get you to where you want to go. Because what it does is that it is not well enough confined and defined. So once you get to information, you're on your way. But actually, to become a great practitioner, one has to go to the next level, which is knowledge. And knowledge is where you convert all of this data that you've assembled, this information that you have carefully put together with the help of others, and then get to knowledge. The fastest way to do that is by having a network which helps you get there. So there's a training aspect of it. There's also, and think of it as, the training aspect is that it gives you all the pieces to the puzzle. But oftentimes just having the pieces to the puzzle doesn't necessarily mean you can put it together. The other aspect that we have built into our network that we're putting together is coaching. Having somebody who can tell you, yes, that's the right piece and it fits here, or something goes here, or something goes there. Now, this isn't just a one-way street. We're all learning this together. We're all growing together. We're all pulling this together. So there's the coaching aspect. And then the third aspect is access to resources. I got extremely lucky to be able to do a leverage buyout from a book, by the way, that I bought because I saw an ad in the Wall Street Journal and I mailed them a check and they mailed me a book. And I found the right resource. I was lucky enough. My father's attorney was aware enough. And by the way, he way undercharged me because he was like captivated that I would actually attempt to do this. But imagine if you didn't have to have that lucky break, that you didn't need that lottery ticket to come through for it to work out. It could have gone the other way. It could have been very, very bad. But most importantly is to have access to those resources and those resources keep growing as the network itself keeps growing. And right now, the network that we're putting in place is growing and it's becoming healthier and it's becoming bigger. So the reason why there's value in joining a network, and you should always demand this of a network. Now you may say, but John, wait a second. If I'm in, you know, pick some, pick a network that is out there publicly, does it offer those same things? Maybe not in the formal sense. However, if you're going to be a member of any network that has designs and desires to get to a end goal, make sure that it incorporates and encapsulates those values that you believe in, but more importantly, those elements that I've just discussed, which help you get to that achievement point and help you get to the place that you need to go. And that's why. I believe it's so valuable to be in a network. All right, Sandra, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, um, what happens to the network effect during the coronavirus? So here's an interesting aspect of the coronavirus. The coronavirus has in some ways tossed everything upside down. And I believe that the simplest way to understand what corona did, and then we'll talk about what networks are doing, is that the coronavirus, for most people, because humans are incrementalists, you know, we incre yeah, and, and, and we have proof of this, right? We don't, you know, I don't even have to go do a big study. We're incrementalists, right? Each day, we're getting a little bit older. Each day, something else is happening. Every day. So we incrementally see these changes, step by step by step by step. And frankly, our life can become relatively stayed and boring. In fact, all of those who are out there who said, well, things are kind of 
you know, at a steady state, don't have much of a historical perspective. But here's what happens during something like the coronavirus is that, well, you're sitting there and you're driving, we're driving in our metaphorical minivan. And, you know, whoever's driving, you know, you have to project, you know, if, is it you? Is it, you know, your significant other? Who, you know, whoever's driving. And then, you know, there's you and then there's, you know, and I don't have kids, but, you know, metaphorically I do. And you're driving down this highway and you're driving behind this truck and this big giant thing falls off right in front of you. Coronavirus. Woo! And as it falls, if you're aware of it, you jerk the steering wheel to get out of its way, right? Because you don't want to slam into this thing. Alerting everybody in the vehicle, right? Everybody is now, because today, you know, people don't even nap in a car because they're looking at their, their screens, they're doing that. And they look up and they go, whoa, whoa, what's going on? And you veer out of the way and then you turn back into that lane and everything is good. That's called deflection. Now, that's what lots of people 80% of the population thinks that we're in deflection. When in fact, we are in inflection. And inflection means we swerved out of the way and we're on a different road, a completely different road, which is not ever going to go to the same destination that the other road was on. So coronavirus has deflected us to a different road in which networks are going to be significantly more important than they were just before early, you know, early March of this year in 2020. And we will be on that road for as long as we are going to be alive. We are never going back to the other road. I would bet money on that. I am betting money on that. And how do I know that? Because I see brands, Brooks Brothers, brands, lucky brand, brands, Hertz, going broke, falling out of the sky. You can't even go out side without an umbrella for all the logos bouncing off of the ground. And why are they going broke? They're going broke because the world has changed. And the network effect means that there will be new networks that never existed before that will coalesce and build from here. There is no other way. We can go back in time. Now, maybe they didn't call them a network, but in fact, it was. It was a change. And we can go back in time and we can see that in times of great turmoil and change, new networks form and the world goes in a different direction for forever. So the coronavirus is just doing that. It is reshuffling the deck and we have to start all over again. One of the most valuable things I ever learned sitting at a poker table is that when you have a bad hand, there's only one thing you should do with it, which is dump the hand understand the money that you've put into the pot is no longer yours. It is never coming back and we have to move on. I meet people who talk about something that happened one year ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, you name it, who will sit there and talk about it as if it had just happened contemporaneously. You have to dump the hand and move on. Coronavirus is telling us we have to go in a different direction. And we must, and we will. Now, doesn't mean that everybody's going to see it. And therein lies the opportunity for all of you who are listening to say, you know what? I'm going to go off in that other direction, and I'm going to become more successful because of that. Now, having said that, hopefully what this has done is it's opened the door and made you think a little bit differently. Now, I build it as building the ideal network. So I'm building a network not because I sat there and said in my life goals, even this year, John, go build a new network. But when opportunity presents itself, the real question is what will you do? How will you react to it? What effort will you put into it? And what will unfold because of it? Most of us see something happen and frankly, we just kind of ignore it. We watch it all fall apart. Take the dot-com bust. When the dot-com bust happened, I knew a lot of people who lost a lot of money. But I also know a lot of people who didn't do a damn thing after it busted. Great recession. I started talking about the housing bubble in 2006. And when it exploded, sadly, because of what I was already doing as a business, 
I wasn't in a position to take advantage of that opportunity. Yet I met people like Johnny. I spoke at an event and Johnny had gone out, raised a lot of money, bought single family homes in Silicon Valley. Now, Johnny flies in a private jet because of the Great Recession. Now, when I asked Johnny, how many houses did you buy, Johnny? He says, well, I mean, it was a lot. Now, I know a lot of real estate investors, a lot is maybe like 50 or 100. How about 6,600? So when I see what's going on today, it is of a magnitude that is greater than the dot-com bust or the Great Recession rolled together and multiplied by who knows what that factor number is. What I hope you do is at least if you do nothing else is that you think differently about how you're going to join whatever network is going to help you in one of the most turbulent times that human history has ever seen. We have never had a global pandemic the way we have it today, which has stopped so many economies and stopped so much of what's going on. If you think it's isolated just to your own shores, you are missing the bigger picture. The question is, is do you sit around and say, part of my life has been ripped out away from me and I've lost this? Or do you say, this is an opportunity? Frankly, I see it as an opportunity. One that I never knew if it was ever going to come in my life, but it did and it happens right now. So if you wanna find out more about what I'm doing and how I'm putting it together, go to turnaroundengine.com, turnaroundengine.com and check it out, learn about it. Maybe it fits you, maybe it doesn't, but there's a lot of, I think, some thought provoking ideas. Also, if you have not done it yet, hopefully you will get there soon, is you go pick up the book. Most businesses fail in the first five minutes. Uh, go to positionwinbook.com. Also, you can go to Amazon and find what we did because of the coronavirus, which is remote work for a better world, remote work for a better world, and check that out. And with that, I just want to thank everybody who has joined us for Raging Verbalist. I want to thank Sandra for coming on. Thank you, Sandra. You're welcome. Thanks for having me as always. And I, what I can say to all of you is, if you don't take advantage of your opportunities, if you don't see them and seize them, then you will have missed them forever. And what I wish, what I hope for you, is that you get very serious about seeing this as an opportunity and go out and seize that opportunity. Seize the day and make that opportunity work for you. I'm John Paul Mendoza, Dr. Speed Selling, and you have just experienced The Raging Verbalist, episode number 36.